Hey everyone, I think we'll get started. Welcome again. My name is Gwen Shufro and I work at the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise. This event is the latest installment of the Tamer Center Social Impact Webinar Series. This series was designed to engage our community by disseminating best practices for the social enterprise sector, as well as to discuss pressing social and environmental challenges. All webinars will be recorded and shared on the center's COVID-19 relief and response webpage. We'll be answering questions during the last 20 minutes of the webinar, so please submit questions through Zoom's Q&A feature. Participants are able to upvote submitted questions using the like button and to add additional comments to the questions. I am now pleased to introduce Shaiza Razavi, who will be moderating today's event. Shaiza is the co-chair of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise Advisory Board and on the investment board of the Tamer Fund for Social Ventures. Shaiza is also a member of the Business School Board of Overseers and on the board of Acumen. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Shaiza. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. And Gwen, thank you and Diane and the whole Tamer team for having done so much to make sure the program at Tamer helps us to continue to push our learning. So thank you very much for that. So good afternoon to everyone. It's terrific to be here digitally connected to so many bright stars out there. What an unbelievable honor to be here with Jacqueline Novogratz and the Tamer Center at Columbia. Both of these communities have been extraordinarily meaningful in my life for they've helped to shape and guide the course of my life in many ways. I chose to follow the path I did because of the influences from these two communities and they still continue to educate me on a daily basis in many ways. Um, before I entered Columbia Business School, I'd just come back from Thailand and I was deeply immersed in work where I was working trying to break the vicious cycle around um, girls who had been sold into prostitution or child labor and children who were faced with the circumstances of living on the street. I found myself landing at Columbia and felt like a complete fish out of water. It was really difficult to figure out where my background and the culture of Columbia really came together. Had I had a center like what the Tamer Center has been able to do over these past years, I think I would have been had a life that was much less fraught with difficulty at that time. And I think I came um, to Columbia exploring and thinking about how community, human experience, ethics, and um, even um, morality to a certain degree could align with businesses and create new possibilities. But I also thought about market forces and whether they could be used to actually help at all in the work that I was doing. Um, those were some of the things I was wondering about at a time when I think Jacqueline Novogratz was actually um, really getting out there, rolling up the sleeves and doing it. Um, when I eventually got my job as a stockbroker, I came across Acumen and I was intrigued about how Acumen was really using the tools of business to solve the world's most intractable problems. You fast forward to about 11 years ago when Jacqueline's bestseller, The Blue Sweater, came out. I began to understand how different pieces in reading that book of my background fit together and a lot more made sense to me. So to have this privilege for me and this opportunity to connect and have the Tamer Center and Acumen come together and think about the thousands upon thousands of people throughout the world that both of these institutions, organizations, have helped and nurtured as leaders. Um, Acumen has entrepreneurs and fellows that it's supported that have impacted over 300 million lives. All the while, Acumen has stayed fully committed to standing with the poor and putting the earth and the vulnerable at the center. They use concrete tools, yet that's only considered step one. The work that Acumen is engaged in is hard. It's filled with challenging choices. The work is about human dignity and is grounded in moral and spiritual truth and toil. It's about having the humility to see the world as it is and the audacity to imagine what the world could be. And that language is borrowed directly from the manifesto of Acumen. What we'll be doing today 
with Jacqueline is to pull apart the hard and the soft because that is really the work of acumen. Jacqueline's book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Building a Better World, has some of the most gorgeous language I've read. It's a deep elaboration of examples and the acumen manifesto. It's filled with principles and practices, guideposts really, and has riveting stories of trauma and possibility. It's a compass for change makers in all of, in the change maker in each one of us. It's steering us towards a life that's worthwhile. And it's a privilege to be in conversation with someone who I admire as much as Jacqueline and who is as intensely focused on improving our world. It's clear that acumen was made for this moment and what a gift it has offered to all of us. So I'd love to, with that, get started. And I told you a little bit, Jacqueline, about my start um, at business school, which was a little bit bumpy. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your time at business school. Um, thanks, thanks, Shiza. <laughs> it's such an honor to speak um, speak to you. And in in, the, in Gwen's wonderful introduction, she said that you were on the board. She didn't say you were the board chair, and so. Um, being able to partner with you and the leadership that you have brought has been extraordinary. And so thank you um, for making this time and having this honor. Also to the whole team at Tamer and Sonia from the Acumen team, just huge thanks um, for making this happen. I feel very similarly uh, to you, Shiza, and Columbia has been a real um, partner and place, uh, both where we've hired some of our best team members as well as a place uh, for sharing ideas and seeing where we can partner. So I actually um, was laughing as you were talking about, you know, your arrival to uh, Colombia after Thailand. Um, I had actually already worked in finance on Wall Street um, in Latin America, but then I had moved to um, Central Africa, Rwanda, where I started the First Nations, the nation's first microfinance bank. Um, prior to going to Stanford Business School. And so I have this great image of driving across the Golden Gate Bridge, listening to Tracy Chapman singing, don't you know, say you want a revolution that comes with like a whisper and thinking, what am I doing? I've just come from one of the poorest countries on the planet, building a microfinance bank, and now I'm going to Stanford Business School. And within the next two months, there were some tectonic shifts that literally changed the world. Um, a weeks after we arrived, an earthquake literally shook the ground. Then Steve Jobs got on stage and, and showed us personal computing and talked about the future. Um, and then in early November, the Berlin Wall fell and it was the end of history. Communism had lost, capitalism won. And, um, and that was really the defining moment for the next 30 years. Um, that just so happened to start at a business school that um, took it on whole hog. And though, though we fancied ourselves global, there were very few classes uh, that had anything global except for maybe Japan. Um, I, none of us owned a cell phone and only the wealthy students had computers. Mm. Um, and you think about what has happened to the world where those promises of market revolutions and technology revolution actually did come to fruition in an incredibly transformative way. We've seen a billion people lifted from poverty, more cell phones on the planet than human beings. All of us are interconnected. I spent three and a half hours this morning with 20 young Bangladeshis discussing things I just couldn't have imagined 30 years ago with tribals and, um, and also people who went to Harvard Business School. That on the other hand, as we all know, with COVID, Black Lives Matter, this particular moment now, 30 years later, a generation later, those same forces of unbridled capitalism and accelerating technology have within them the potential to destroy us. Um, we're more divided, divisive than ever in our lifetimes. We're facing uh, catastrophic climate change and as I just said, COVID has laid bare um, what that has meant to our health systems, our education systems, our food systems. And so now for me, Shiza, it's, it's a time of reinvention. And there would be no better time to be at 
a business school or, um, or really just to be alive because this is a, a new moment for us to say, all right, now how do we take the best of what we've seen and carry it forward and jettison what will no longer work for a world that is fully interdependent? Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I, it's amazing when you look back at when you started school to this moment in this COVID world where we're distributed, all content is actually being distributed. You think of a university like Columbia or even Stanford where you went, where the learning was within the four walls. And now all of a sudden it's out there distributed if you have access to broadband and more people do than um, ever before. But I think in thinking about all of these changes and seismic shifts right now, what do you think is the role of business school in fostering leaders with the moral imagination that you talk about in your book? Well, you use the word of moral imagination that I think for, for 30 years, we, we were taught the, the tools and techniques of technical, technological and market revolutions. And now we need to include the, the hard skills and practices of moral revolution. We need to redefine success, which is incredibly hard. And I think it sits in the center of our business schools um, where we have defined it by money, power, fame. US World and News Report looks at the most successful alumni, um, the most successful schools. And we lift those entrepreneurs who have been financially most successful. This is a moment for us to recalibrate look inward and, and ask ourselves, how do we use these critical skills and tools of understanding markets, knowing how to use them, deploying capital, building talent, enabling supply chains, not only to create companies that maximize shareholder wealth, which in 1989 was taught to me as not only our fiduciary responsibility, but our ethical responsibility. Mm. How do we now take seriously the move to a stakeholder society that puts our shared humanity and the sustainability of the earth at the center of our systems and not just profit? Mm -hmm. That is the challenge. And the, for the business schools that really take us to the next level, that's where the focus um, will be, not only the, 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 the techniques and the technologies, as I said, how do we measure impact, not just financial, um, and I could go on and on, but I really think it's the skills and tools of moral leadership um, that have to regenerate and rejuvenate every one of our corporations, governments, and nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting in the book that launched on May 5th, each chapter represents a different principle. And then you have elaborations of the principles, and then you have a way to perhaps the stories that you tell allow us to then concretize or feel those principles in a way where we can apply it to our own daily practice or our own practice and how we want to walk through the world. And I think that's, that's amazing, but why, why now? And on the same day, on the 5th of May, you launched something else, the Acumen Academy, and you, you did them hand in hand and thinking about business schools, the book and the principles and practices, and now this academy. Help me understand why now. Um, so as you said, um, when you were introducing Acumen, we've invested in about 130 companies within the domain of our patient capital. So this is philanthropic capital that we raise. We invest in incredibly early stage for-profit companies mm -hmm. and, and stay with them for 10 to 15 years. And that 125, has essentially helped move another $750, $800 million into our market. So we've now seen about a billion dollars move into market serving very low income people. Um, have learned a lot about all of the th things I was talking about before. We now have three for-profit funds, another 150 million under management, and are looking at whether you can bring those values into the for-profit sector and Shaz, as I step back and prepare, um, and was preparing um, for Acumen's 20th, thinking, how do we re renew for the next chapter? What have I learned? How do I, what differentiates those entrepreneurs that, does just, that don't just create singular companies, but are actually disrupting entire systems and influencing nations? 
the one differentiator is character. Um, could talk all about their ideas and their technologies and their business plans and their teams. But if they have the character to see the world that can be, to be super realistic about the world that they are in, to immerse themselves in the lives of the people that they want to change and to stick with it with resiliency and grit, I'll bet on them every time. And so then when you start unpacking that and you wanna build and release a new generation of change makers, what are the practices, which I think are as important as the principles that they need to start cultivating in themselves? Hmm. Um, where the academy came in is that we have fellows programs around the world and now have about 750 fellows within the Acumen community and they're doing just unbelievable things, but at very early stages. And so looking forward to watching them change. But in building those programs, we started to see the hunger of not just a new generation, but I would say for, for all of us to do more, to make change and to make change in ways that aren't just feel good nor do good, but are actually tackling some of the most complex and challenging issues of our times. Mm -hmm. And so could you put a university online in ways that taught not just content, but also character? And that mm -hmm. was the beginning of Acumen Academy. And it's exciting because we're already now in conversation about partnering with a number of business schools so that we can bring Acumen Academy into the schools and have real laboratories um, within and um, extended into the world. It's interesting that you, if you talk about a character, a laboratory, building character, there are so many ways that we're seeing in the context today that people are feeling so much pressure and when there are mistakes made or really flawed character that's pushed forward, um, there's a deconstructing, a breakdown, a, a calling out of people in the, in the world. And that's one approach. It's an interesting approach of being able to say, this is not what we want we don't want this element or this character or this way in our society. And we want to be able to get out there and explain that this is wrong. That hasn't been your approach. It's, it's a, and you've, you've come across so many difficult situations within Acumen, um, corruption, difficulties, and you don't actually scream from the rooftops when you do find corruption and difficulties of that sort. You have a different approach. What is your approach? Um, well, yeah, I, I'm constitutionally not a shame person, but I actually think she has it actually, it even goes deeper. Um, and it's been funny with the word moral in a book, um, written by a woman who spent her life really using the tools of finance, um, uh, moral revolution. And the editor was very unhappy with that. Um, but the, when I talk about moral for an interdependent world, it isn't from a sense of righteousness or um, a singular set of rules that are imposed by some authority from above. But it's really having the, the courage and the persistence to navigate between many different competing belief systems that are existing in the world right now, but being anchored in a compass that is based in human dignity. And that is hard to do. It is not the road to purity, um, but it is the road to human flourishing. And so I think that I was deeply influenced by with the Rwandan genocide. You know, I started the nation's first microfinance there, bank there with a small group of Rwandan women. Um, seven years after our founding, they ended up playing every conceivable role of the genocide. And when I went back to visit, what I discovered was not that there were angels amongst them and monsters amongst them, but that every human being has angels and monsters within them, within us. Mm -hmm. um, and that the monsters are really our broken parts, which is not an excuse, but it is in times of fear and insecurity, um, a moment where it gets really easy to prey on our fears and insecurities. And when we do, it often makes other people do terrible things. Mm -hmm. And so my approach has always been to call it out. Um, you know, I'm used on the team for my own moral authority within it, 
where if we are unhappy or find something that doesn't look right with an entrepreneur or a company, the team will go in first. If needed, I will then be the heavy that comes in and I will have very difficult, um, honest conversations. If I see someone is on the journey and, and, will, and is both willing to um, change the path that they are on, mm -hmm. uh, and in some cases publicly speak to the people that they, we need to have them speak to, that's one conversation. If they say, and this has happened in nu numerous times, you know, Jacqueline, you just don't understand the way business is done in fill in the blank country. Um, we're not changing. You're so naive. You're idealistic. We will exit really fast. Hmm. When I look back, Shiza, and, so, and a number of young people have said in the book, you don't name anybody that you call, that you talk about in terms of corruption. And I say, well, you know, I don't really have to name them because they're either they, they ended up on the front page of the newspaper anyway, or um, in one case, they're in jail, or they, they lost everything along the way. And I'm not a person who believes in karma in that sense, but I do believe that this stuff catches up with you. And on the contrary, I also believe that if you stick to the road of integrity, while it is harder to do the right thing, not the easy thing, over time, you have trust. And trust is the rarest currency that we have access to on the planet. And I think that's one of the reasons in this time of COVID, when Acumen wanted to raise significant millions of dollars in grant funding so that we could enable our companies to survive um, this emergency, it was just a few phone calls and no one said, but you don't make grants. How will you do it this quickly? What are you betting on? 18, 19 years later, they know that you are betting on character, you are bringing character, you will be transparent. And um, we need more of that in our world. And I worry with social media, um, where we are canceling each other left, right, and center, that that kind of trust is harder to build. And it's, a, it's, it's another muscle we have to learn to cultivate inside ourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's so many, there's so many entrepreneurs, you have stories where I think whether the investment has succeeded or not succeeded, you've really learned from the work and been able to use the market as a listening device, as you've referred to it as. But a lot of times, one of your chapters, the, the first one is just start. And I think a lot of people have wonderful ideas and they just want to start. And then you say, just start, but wait, you first listen. And you listen to a market, you listen to those who understand the products that they need, you use the market as a listening device, you then think about it for a while. And is it, you just start, and how do you view, like looking at Acumen, serving the poor, how do you actually view the role of the market in starting? Yeah, I mean, there's, everything is nuanced. I mean, move fast and break things gets us a really long way, but it's also created a lot of disaster. So, um, the reason I say just start and let the work teach you is because I have gotten so many emails and requests for conversations about how do I find my purpose mm -hmm. or where people would are doing what I would call provisional living. You know, Jacqueline, I really want to do this kind of work after I make enough money to do this after I get married, have kids, make enough money at, and, and, and we just don't know what tomorrow is. Um, and so I say now, if you see an opportunity disguised as some big, ugly problem, just start, walk toward it, learn about it, understand it, um, but keep moving. And, and before you know it, you'll move your way in. The, one of the examples that you're very close to um, was after we were, we were only about four months old, six months old. Um, when 9-11 happened, we were a team of four. Our countries uh, were India and East Africa. We'd not made a single investment and we only had three donors. So we were fledgling, um, to put it mildly. And yet when 9-11 happened, something inside me just was lit up 
that this was a moment mm -hmm. to reach outward into the world when the whole world was pulling inward. And it was a moment particularly of me reaching out to the Muslim world, which most of America didn't understand very well. And, um, and I got cold feet at the beginning. You know, I'd never been to Pakistan, which was the country we decided we would start working in. And a really wise man said to me, Jacqueline, if you go when everybody is running away and you have the courage to stay for 10 years, at the end of that period, you're gonna know more than most people. And it was such great advice. And the second great piece of advice came to me the day I got there, um, when I randomly met a, um, a, a now 93 year old man named um, Said Barbarelli. So he was 72 probably. And um, he was like, you know, we see people like you come and go all the time. So if you want to partner, help, help here, oh, keep your head down, learn before you do anything. And um, when you've done something, well, then you can start talking. And he ended up chairing our board when we started and, um, and the way that the universe conspires toward your success. Um, turned out to be one of the most influential businessmen in the in the region, not just the country, Said Barbarelli. And um, had I not gotten on that plane, though I only had two names of people I had never met before, that wouldn't have been part of Acumen. That wouldn't have helped us in this moment um, understand the way the world works in a much more nuanced and layered way. Mm -hmm. That's in some ways what's so interesting about Academy is that it's going to pull people out who never would have come across each other or been aware of each other as they start to do the work. How, how you know, can you describe something that, um, how being a woman has helped or hindered your career path or the fact that you keep talking about in the book, you know, you ended up in Rwanda, you look to Brazil, you go to Pakistan and it's extraordinary. Like at 25 years old to have the guts to just go and, and visit and see and see how it ends up. But would love to hear about the, the role of being a woman in this in finance and all of it. Well, as a young banker um, um, at Chase Manhattan Bank on Wall Street, um, on, on the one hand, I was a producer. And on the other hand, um, I definitely was taken to task. I mean, it was another era for dressing like Linda Ronstadt and laughing too loudly. And so um, we were graded on our professionalism. And since I didn't wear a man suit with a little bow tie, I got downgraded um, to the point where my, um, my, uh, my, my promotion was delayed a month to send a message to me. And that was a really important turning point, Shiza, for me because it could have made me smaller. Um, but I remember looking at my boss who I was not that impressed with, quite frankly. Um, and he said, look, Jacqueline, you have a choice. You could be one of the women that is in a very prominent position. We could groom you to be one of the more prominent um, players at this bank, but you have to change the culture. Because if you stay, whether you fight it or not, the culture will change you. Hmm. And I don't think he realized in that conversation what a gift he was giving me, Shiza. Hmm. Because I thought, but I work here like 90 hours a week. And so you're actually saying not just it will change who I am at work. You are actually saying it will change me. And, um, and that was part of my decision to go and try to start banking outside the traditional system in Africa. Um, and then I would say... Um, and so there, even there, it was an advantage and a disadvantage. It was an advantage in that I stood out. They were clearly already thinking about the few women they had and who did they want to cultivate to become leaders in their bank. Um, mm -hmm. On the negative side, you were expected to behave, you know, like a man. Um, in the um, in the world after. In East Africa, particularly, they called me Mstichana Kidogo, which means little girl. Um, and that was, a, on the one hand, a negative. On the positive, everyone underestimated me, underestimated me. And so to have the 
I don't even know if it was audacity, the recklessness to think at age 25 that you could start a bank um, was made easier by the fact that nobody thought we could do it. Since then, I would say I have been able to be in very uncomfortable situations and say truths in ways that other people can hear um, because in a way, we all have bulls and do doves inside ourselves. But I think I've been more comfortable letting the dove front and the bull stay inside so that um, I can navigate very difficult conversations with very powerful um, people and very poor people um, that I feel having lived as a woman who's had to understand the the dominant system and experience it as an outsider from my generation, um, it's given me a different kind of skill set. And I would say that right now, Chiza, as the world is so interdependent, those of us, you, who have many, many different layers inside of yourself mm. um, that have experienced the world as an outsider actually have a superpower in that there are are many more layers that you can connect in yourself to reach out to other people. Because I think that we've gotten to a point where we use identity too much as a, a weapon to divide us when the, there's this extraordinary power within it to use it instead as a tool to connect us. Mm -hmm. That's such an, a point to underscore and that even investing in the stock market oftentimes the people who have the perspective of the other, who have a different way of interpreting the information are the ones who help me understand what's special or different about this particular company. And that atypical nonconformist really is the one who allows me to see the perspective in a way that I wouldn't and is the most helpful. Mm. And I feel like when, when you started at Chase, it was shareholder first galore you know, at that point. And now you're asking people to say, let's consider stakeholder models and let's consider how we redefine success. How do we measure that? And what's, how do we know that's rigorous? And well, what, let me also just stop you because the business round table has said, let's consider stakeholder models. Where I think we actually have an opportunity right now is that that there's an entire generation that truly believes that capitalism hasn't just run its course, but there are many within the generation that think we should throw out capitalism altogether. Yes. Yeah. Then within the spectrum are those who say, wait a minute, we've got to learn to use markets, but not be seduced by them. And I would say that is where I sit having worked and lived in socialist societies as well as in capitalist societies. Um, it, again, it comes down to leadership and that every change maker, whether you are a business leader or a nonprofit leader or you are in government, we have to understand how markets work, where they are effective and where they are um, limited, where they exclude, um, yeah. in, in some cases where they exploit. And that isn't comfortable attention for market ideologists, nor for those who have no trust in business. That's where the generative capability and creativity of the market sit. And so for me right now, it is identifying those role models and business models that are really getting to um, reach much larger scale by starting with understanding the people you are serving, the employees you are hiring, and the, the way you are protecting the environment. Um, and insisting as well on making a profitable company. Um, to your point on, and we can talk about some of those examples if, you, if you'd if you like, Shiza. To your point on metrics, um, what's important from Acumen's perspective is that we bring the perspective of the people who have been excluded um, as the main voice. And so we have a system we developed inside Acumen that we a year and a half ago spun off as a for-profit company called 60 Decibels, um, which uses the technique of lean data developed by Acumen, where we will 
text five, 10,000 customers from one of our companies uh, simultaneously. We'll ask them a series of 10 questions from which we can deduce changes in income, changes in, if it's a solar light company, the, the, um, the, their health, the children's education, how many more hours do they stay up at night? Um, MPS, you know, are they satisfied with the program? Um, were they using kerosene before so that we can actually measure carbon displacement? And we don't always like what we find, uh, but it gives us such in-depth understanding of um, the impact of our companies, not just the uh, financial returns. And even in our for-profit companies, when we not only benchmark, but when we look at carry, we have impact hurdles that must be met before carry will be paid so that everything starts aligning investor, entrepreneur, customer. Mm -hmm. So are you impressed with any CEOs or other leaders? I mean, I know that I have learned in my time working with Acumen through so many of the businesses that Acumen partners with in thinking about what really does define the values that you describe and where you can see success. So who would, who would be the people you're impressed with? In some of the there's so many of the Acumen entrepreneurs that really kind of blow my mind in terms of their recognition that we are the system so we can create the system, um, even though it is the long, hard road. There's a guy named Tyler Youngblood um, who randomly um, chanced upon you know, the coffee industry in Colombia and decided he was gonna start a coffee company, but the more he got into it, the more he understood that there's a reason that the average farmer worldwide is 58 years old. Um, it is, for the most part, backbreaking work for no money. And when you look at 80% of the world's poor making under $2 a day, they are in fact smallholder farmers. And so um, he started, he just started, he got curious. One of the first things he learned is that uh, a large percentage of Colombian farmers, though they make the best coffee in the world, grow the best cost coffee in the world, um, don't cover their price, their costs. And so you wonder, like, why would they continue doing it anyway? But the status quo is profound and so is tradition. And so Tyler um, decided that while he understood global's commodities, global commodities pricing, for coffee, it all... The only thing that seems to really matter is what happens in Brazil. Brazil has a bumper crop, crop like it did a year ago, and the mm -hmm. price will go from $3 a pound to 99 cents a pound, um, making it impossible for farmers almost anywhere else in the world to cover their costs, particularly if they, on the other hand, have had a bad year. And so Tyler said, why do we have to worry about these commodities prices, particularly if you have a premium coffee? And can you increase quality, have better paid farmers, um, happier customers by starting with the production costs of the farmer? We would call this, this is the moral imagination in, in action. Understand the perspective from their shoes. Number two, immerse and understand where the systems are in their way and also understand where they themselves might be in their own way. And so, he negotiates with the farmers after he understands the production costs. Sometimes it's two, three times what the global price, so prices are. Then he's got to build trust. He's got to accompany these farmers so that they can actually play as market participants, um, provide training and other inputs so that they can improve their quality. And um, it's about a $10 million profitable company now, but he's not done, even though he's proving that um, companies like Stumptown are excited to buy um, from Azahar, which is the name of Tyler's company, because they see the quality of the beans, the quality of the farmers, um, and they have a relationship, a community of trust. But when I've been in Colombia, so have I seen people, you know, retailers from Florida that also feel super proud um, that they can do this. And now Tyler's looking at um, an insistence on a living wage for the farmers um, and the possibility of anybody who buys a cup of Azahar will know the farmer that created the micro batch that is in the cup that they are drinking and they can um, 
send in an extra nickel or what have you uh, to that farmer. And so I think that as we're all focused on the, the macro, on the edges is a whole community of entrepreneurs that are not going to do business as usual anymore and are, are finding new models that aren't just throwing away markets, but are actually pulling them closer because of their, their unbelievable potential to release human energy, innovation, freedom, and efficiency. But they need to be bridled in a way that we let them get unbridled for way too long. Right. And that's where I think you started something when it wasn't defined. Many of the entrepreneurs within Tamer Acumen are actually going to go create systems or create businesses before they've really been defined. And that is so invigorating, but it's also, as you get going, quite lonely. And I think the idea that along the way, along the journey, if it's a journey for your lifetime, but as many of these journeys and the ones that you've described in the books are ones that are much longer than just one lifetime. What are some of the milestones or the markers that you maybe look for and would be important to notice to feel like you are succeeding, mm. even though it's not necessarily one way? It's such a great question, um, Shiza. I mean, for anyone who's out there who is either thinking about starting something or in the early years of, of, of running something that they started, the early years are can be lonely and feel self-defeating sometimes for a different reason than you feel 15, 20, 35 years in. Um, in that the in the early years, we all now tell the great entrepreneur story of, you know, if they tell you you're crazy, you're on to something. And I certainly had a lot of people tell me I was crazy. And this also may go to gender to Shiza. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning of starting Acumen, it, it sometimes felt like it was humiliation, one humiliation after another of, um, I was almost 40. And yet people would say, you know, well, you clearly don't understand how business works. Um, and then they would go on to explain to me how business works. And, um, and sitting through meeting after meeting after meeting like that, and knowing that while I didn't know the answers, I knew that the way it was working wasn't working for the poor. And so at least we would try. And probably one of the most radical examples of that was when um, we had made an investment in a a company that had all of nine ambulances and was trying to disrupt the broken, corrupt, loaded Indian emergency services market. Um, and I had made this big presentation in front of about 350 uh, established people. And um, a very prominent Indian businessman stood up and said, you know, with all respect, nine ambulances? Do you know how many people live in Mumbai? And at the time it was 17 million. And he said, um, you know, this is the problem with people like you. Social enter enterprise, it's for people who, are, who think they're too smart and they th do things that are too small and mm -hmm. then it makes them too righteous. And while I was just like, well, like nothing else is working, so let's just try it. There was a little part of me that thought, well, what if he's right? Like, what if we can't scale this? Mm -hmm. And um, and then it was a couple of years later when the terror attacks in Mumbai happened. And there, I can't even describe the feeling, it makes me almost cry, but of watching those, our ambulances in front of all of the burning buildings in Mumbai and thinking, oh my goodness, we're doing it. These guys are doing it. And that was also the beginning from, for the company to morph from a pure private play to private public. And now it's one of the largest ambulance companies in the world with 13,000 employees and 3,500 ambulances, bringing about 4 million people to hospital every year. There were really low times for that company and I could accompany them more because I had to build something myself when everyone also told me that was crazy. Mm. And now I would say, this work is, is a vocation. This work comes from a place of, of truly believing that all things are connected and that human beings have a 
deep intrinsic value um, that we're part of each other. And there's almost a spiritual component in that. And so now when I'm feeling really low um, or no matter how hard you try, someone's telling you what you're not doing right. Um, now I remind myself, number one, what am I doing this for? Number two, what are the, what's the progress that we have made? And number three, for me, I look for beauty. I find it. Um, and I remember that there's beauty at every step of this path. And then it, it may not be beauty in a conventional sense, but there is beauty in showing up. There is beauty in paying attention. There is beauty in the way that we can connect with people across every line of difference. Um, because it's in that place that we can just rediscover, I, I guess, the transformational power that exists within our shared humanity. Mm. I think we um, could go on for six hours because we have so many questions. And that was um, a beautiful explanation in what you've seen. And one of the questions was really about how does Acumen measure their impact in these companies with job creation, accelerated increases and in disposable income or what are the things that are measured? I think you described some of them right now and what you just answered. But someone else is asking about challenging the status quo. Can you say more about the risk versus the reward in that moment of challenging the status quo? When I first saw, you know, to, to the extremes, we have three conference rooms at Acumen named for um, extraordinary friends of mine who were murdered in challenging the status quo. So I have seen the extreme price that some people pay for going against um, the status quo. And sometimes you don't even know um, that the stakes can be very high. But those are extreme. Excuse me. For the most part, it's that people don't, you don't, we don't understand how powerful the status quo can be. And so a few things I learned along the way would be, um, you wanna bring in housing or water, which is in the government's domain, education. Um, and you think that by creating this new alternative model, that government will see it and they will adopt it and that this will be a really great way to scale it. When in fact, um, it can be very threatening to the status quo. Um, and I've seen this in every single sector in which we work to the point where I, I used to have a litmus test that as soon as we would hit 250,000 customers, there would be some form of sabotage of the company and it would almost always play itself out. Um, and so I learned number one, not to get too cocky and number two, to get underneath why. It's not that government officials don't want you to succeed but that if you aren't actually reaching out to create the right kind of government relationships and partnerships, then it can be threatening that you're doing something that is in their domain. And that is where, again, these hard skills of learning to partner with humility and audacity and holding these op opposing truths and tension becomes so important. Um, you're still going to, you're still going to upset a status quo. In off-grid energy, it was the kerosene and the diesel mafias. Literally, there would be a point when you're bringing solar into communities and you think it's hard enough to convince low-income people who have no trust in you to try a newfangled thing where they might lose their money, um, that's really hard. Then they have no financing, that's really hard. Then there are no roads and infrastructure and distribution system, super hard. So you start to get those things going and then the kerosene mafias do not want you selling solar because you are displacing them. And the diesel mafias that are more powerful than the kerosene mafias are gonna come at you next. And so it's almost, it's almost around one being super strategic and almost having fun with it um, rather than being crushed by it. Because at the end of the day, when you do have a product that is affordable, valued, and change people's lives. And that is where the metrics come in. Um, it works. Mm -hmm. So what, another question. Great relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, looking back, what would you do differently in the initial stages of um, founding Acumen? And if you can share some of your most valuable learning lessons for people who are just about to start in their own ventures, I think that would be really helpful. Um, 
when I say what I would do differently, I'm not actually sure I believe that I would do this differently. So take this with a grain of salt. Um, because every choice you make has a cost. And so what the, when I, my knee jerk to that is that I founded Acumen, I was a New Yorker. I founded it in, in New York as a New Yorker. Um, and I had a team in New York. There's a big part of me that thinks if I were to do it again, I would have gone to the communities where I was building first, um, possibly in Nairobi, and have created the, the headquarters for Acumen there. Um, because I could have immersed and built the team that then could be kind of like the Jesuit model and take Acumen to other places. Focus on just one, um, one region and really understand it. Um, which is of course now what we tell every one of our companies, go deep, get the unit economic right, and economics right before you think about um, expanding. Uh, but like so many young reckless entrepreneurs, I was in five countries when I had a team of four people uh, and that made it really hard and we made some unnecessary mistakes. Where I would have been based is not as clear to me though because I also needed to raise the money to give us the run ramp so that I could do this work. But I think immerse where you want to, where your end customers are, which is more important than when you're, where your funders are. And two, um, get the unit economics right before you start to expand to other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and my advice and wisdom in just starting um, would be go faster. Um, listen, don't think you have the answer. Use the lens of your moral imagination. Too many of you, us use only our own lens, even when we design systems for people whose lives are unlike our own. There's a real arrogance in that. Go immerse, design from their perspective, um, and then take risks. Another great piece of advice early on was a guy, an older man who ran a big a corporation who said, um, when I told him I couldn't find anything good to invest in, he said, well, so invest in something mediocre. And I was like, I've just raised all this money to do something that nobody believes in anyway. And now you're actually signing me up for failure. And he was like, I'm signing you up for learning. I'm signing you up for starting. And it was so scary because I knew that our first three investments were mediocre. Um, but they taught me that you know, one was a technology that an electromagnetic immunosensor that nobody really understood. Like, don't invest in technology if you don't really understand. Um, uh, actually, and medical technologies take a whole lot of capital that we did not have. So I learned so fast uh, what we could and could not do. Um, but then you need, you need angel funders, angel investors or funders that are true early adopters and are going to go with you through those failures. Um, there is great power in failing early because if you don't risk those failures, you will not succeed. Mm -hmm. And surround yourself with people who think differently than you do, who will hold you accountable, but also have um, a board and a team where there is enough vulnerability and trust that you can talk about the things that go wrong without any fear. Um, my founding board members are um, so cherished in my life and Shiza knows some of them, that there's a, you know, this, we've been on a 25, 30 year journey now. And, um, and you have to keep renewing. You have to keep, you know, there are term limits for a reason, but there are also people that will hold you when it feels like you're completely by yourself. Wonderful. And can you, one um, other question I have here is, can you share examples of how Acumen works with companies and what activities differentiate the work from other impact investors? That's a big question. And we only have two minutes. So um, we have a number of big corporate relationships um, and we work with the corporations in very different ways. We'd work with a Bain or an EY consulting um, both in terms of strategy, we're, we're Bain's largest pro bono um, partner and have been for a decade. 
Um, but and with EY, we'll actually put externs into our companies. And so there's mutual learning. I would say that there's a real, um, the algorithm is, are you clear about what this partnership is for, what each party gets from it, what each party gives to it, and much more importantly, what is the world gain? Um, we'll partner with the Unilever to try to help build more inclusive supply chains with, a, with an IKEA, um, another deep partnership really focused on climate and the verticals in which, with which Acumen works. They push us, we push them, and, um, and the learning is deeply mutual and full of respect. Um, I could go on. We have, we have so many Autodesk, Barclays, mm -hmm. MetroLife, so many companies with whom we work in very real, real ways. And what differentiates Acumen is the first line of our manifesto. It starts by standing with the poor. A lot of impact investing does good things um, by investing in commercially viable companies and helping to grow them. Um, Acumen invests in early stage companies that are specifically focused on serving low-income people. Um, that's a bar very few in the impact space um, are, are, are passing. And it's where we really need more capital, more resources, more intellect, um, particularly again in this moment of crisis where what we've seen is that by not protecting the vulnerable and the poor, we have a situation where all of us lose. And to flip that requires a, a reinvigoration of those models that insist on putting the poor first and then making the capital work. Mm. So Jacqueline, after I was watching the protests after the murder of George Floyd, and I kept coming back to your book, and you often talk about that quiet um, presence of privilege that is often undetectable by the bearer, but the importance of perspective. You talk about perspective and the moral imagination standing in different places. I think that there's this place where privilege can be deafening, especially to those who are less vulnerable. And I think that there's so many bright stars who are heading out into the world right now. And what advice and wisdom and the grace with which you have shared it is, um, incredibly helpful to all of us and just want to say that it's such an honor to have you here and to have you and the tamer community together on this long and hard journey that'll last a lot longer than either of our lifetimes so thank you for taking this time to be with us today really appreciate it thank you shiz and thank you to every one of you on the call and i just wish you the best of luck because um, the world has never needed you more <laughs>